What is up, everybody? Welcome to TK's Two Cents. Every Tuesday, every Thursday, 12 p.m. Eastern Time, I'm going to be live streaming. I promise you that I'm going to be under 15 minutes, no matter where I'm at. When I hit that 15-minute mark, I'm going to stop talking, and I will probably stop talking faster than that. Uh, what is happening? So, so, so what I do here in this space is I highlight a couple of tweets, and I, I take it beyond 140 characters, give a little context, give a little further thought about what inspired me to write that, you know, or how to put it in application or whatever it may be. So let's just go ahead and dive right in. All right, tweet number one. Don't let social media trick you into thinking that you need to become a journalist or a commentator to change the world. Local relationships are still real. Most of the difficult, and uh, what did I write here? This uh, Most of the difficult and important work lies in that realm and most of it won't be reported on. All right, so there is a movie called, um, what is it? Uh, oh my gosh, The, the Imaginarium of Dr. Uh, Par Parnassus. I think I'm saying it right. The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. I think it was one of Heath Ledger's last movies. Johnny Depp was in it, Colin Farrell, uh, Farrell was in it, a lot of different people. But there's this scene in that movie where the devil goes to like this monastery. And this monastery is in like this remote corner of the earth. Nobody knows about this place. And the devil walks in and he sees a bunch of monks sitting on like these, these meditation mats. And each monk has a book in, in, in their hands and they're reading some kind of story. And they're all just reading their own story like at the same time or whatever. And he, he goes to Dr. Parnassus, who is like the, the head of this monastery. And he, he says to him, what exactly do you guys do here? And Dr. Parnassus says, we tell the eternal story. And the devil says, all right, and what exactly is that? And he says, it is the story that sustains the universe in existence, without which we would have nothing. And the devil says, so let me get this straight. If you stop telling this story, then everything disappears and just goes away. And the doctor says, you make it sound so simple. And the devil says, and you actually believe that nonsense. Well, let's put it to the test. And he takes out some device that he has and he's able to silence the mouths of all the monks in the monastery. So now they're trying to talk, but they, mm, mm, they can't get their story out. And Dr. Parnassus is starting to get really nervous and all the other monks are starting to freak out because this is their job. They are ordained for this task of keeping the universe alive by telling their story and nothing seems to happen. And the devil says, see, the fire is still burning. The snow is still falling down. The wind is still blowing. Looks like everything's fine to me. I just set you free. I liberated you from wasting your time with foolish nonsense, like believing that this story you're telling matters. Now you can go shopping. Now you can go on a cruise. Now you can go enjoy your life. And at that moment, this bird flies over the devil's head and poops on the devil's head. And Dr. Parnassus laughs. And in that moment, he has an epiphany. He says, that was a sign. That was a sign from on high. He says, now I realize why we're all still here and everything is okay because somewhere, someone is still telling a story. It can be a romance, it can be a fantasy, it can be a story of unforeseen death, but there is always a human being somewhere, somewhere that's telling a story and that is what keeps this universe alive. And I thought that was just a powerful illustration for this idea that you even see in the Bible where the apostle Paul says, we are living epistles to be, to be read of all men that every one of us is living a story, that we all have our own hero's journey. And the best way to impact the world is to be faithful to that story. Um, I was just talking with a pastor yesterday who was talking about in C.S. Lewis's novel, The Great Divorce, that like the most noble soul in heaven, this man goes to heaven, and the most noble soul there is this woman and, and nobody even knows her name. And, 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 and the point of that moment was that you know, it's it's not necessarily the person that's the most famous. It's not necessarily the purpose that is front and center. It's not necessarily the person that is the loudest that is having the biggest impact. And in times like what we're in right now, it can be so easy to think that the best way to change the world is to be sharing some article or to be writing your opinion on Twitter. 
And you better believe it, we need all of that. So don't hear any of this as some kind of either or dichotomous thinking that says it's only one or the other. But the majority of change that's going to happen in this world is going to happen from ordinary people or seemingly ordinary people, because none of us are truly ordinary, but seemingly ordinary people that are living their lives with mindfulness. So you, you, you could put it this way. You could say that the biggest problem in our world isn't that there aren't enough articles to read or podcasts to listen to. It's not that there isn't enough information to share. The biggest problem in our world is that there aren't enough people who are embodying that information within the context of everyday life. We don't just need people who are writing articles and who are sharing these things on Twitter and Instagram. We need people that are going into schools and teaching our children with a mindfulness of the valuable information that's out there. We need people that are starting businesses and that are treating their coworkers, treating their, their employees with mindfulness that comes from having internalized the valuable information out there. We need people that are pastors at churches. We need people that are choir members. We need people that are actors and that are playwrights, people that are musicians and composers. We need people in every walk of life. And so whatever your creativity is, whatever your set of talents are, that too is an essential service. And it's so easy when you're just kind of focusing on what's trending, what's hot, what's being talked about and who's the loudest to kind of think like, well, unless I'm working on the, you know, the medical front lines or unless I'm a journalist who's reporting on what's going on with, with riots or with protests, you know, my work doesn't matter. But the reality is local relationships are still real. Most of the important work is gonna happen in that area. We need people that will not only share the valuable information out there, but people that will allow that valuable information to transform them so that they can treat the people in their neighborhoods and their schools and their families in a different way. What do I do? What do I do? We always wanna know, what do we do with information? But sometimes the real question is, what is the information doing to us? And how can we allow that transformation to be, to be shown, to be displayed, to be expressed within the context of our everyday ordinary life. Never value that context because that's where change happens. Let's go to tweet number two. All right, this is a good one for me. This, this one is near and dear to my heart. Never confuse fuel with fire. For every fire, there's someone somewhere who pours fuel on it for the sake of political gain. But those who pour the fuel are not the same as those who fuel the fire. Don't let your anger, I'll even say don't let your legitimate anger, at fuel feeders um, negate meaningful discussions with those who are living in the midst of real fire. Okay, let's, let's talk about media for a second. Let, let, let's just make a simple observation. Media is not some sort of objective, neutral source of information that is here to give us knowledge independently of economic incentives, okay? Now, you can take that harshly, you can be offended by that, you can be upset by that, but that's not a necessary response, okay? That's no different from me saying, you know, McDonald's or, or Chick-fil-A or Toyota, that these are not, you know, places that just give you things without any thought of their own self-interest. There's nothing wrong with having self-interest. There's nothing wrong with having economic incentives. All the danger lies in ignoring the fact that these things play a role. It's okay to have biases. We all have biases. The danger happens when we mistake our subjectivity for objectivity by either pretending that we don't have biases or being unaware of what our biases are. We can evaluate things more intelligently in a more nuanced manner if we include the whole picture. And that means we got to not only look at the individuals and the institutions, but we got to look at the incentives that drive them. And so when you look at media, the incentives that drive what stories get told and what, what stories get emphasized, they don't always show up as, as being fair, you know, in, 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 when, you, when you compare it to the way that we deal with things in everyday life. I'll give you an example that has nothing to do with what anybody's debating right now. Let's take Kobe Bryant. The beginning of this year, Kobe Bryant passed away. Man, I, I'm such a big fan of Kobe that broke my heart, you know? But, you know, there were like, I want to say like eight other people on that plane. And, 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 and I'm probably illustrating my own point by, by not even knowing how many people were on that plane. How many of you know the names of all those other people that died? 
It was a helicopter. How many people know all the names of those people who died? Most people don't know the names of those people, but we all know that Kobe Bryant died. Kobe Bryant had a, a special that was on national TV. We watched his funeral on national television, y'all. And, you know, he had a really big funeral with all sorts of celebrities there, all sorts of political figures and, and things along those lines who showed up to say something positive about him. What about those other people? You know, they weren't all over television. We, 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 we didn't have the same amount of emphasis on that. Is there something sad about that? You better believe it. You better believe there's something sad about that. But how unwise would it be if I were to make the observation that this is sad and imbalanced, but then go take that out on Kobe Bryant's wife and then go take that out on Kobe Bryant's family and go yell at them for the fact that the media is being selective in what it chooses to prioritize and what it chooses to emphasize. We have to make the distinction between what the media shines a spotlight on and what everyday people are doing and talking about. There are things that are happening in everyday life that are really beautiful, that are really hopeful, that are really inspiring. And the media doesn't find those things politically or economically profitable to talk about. So those things make boring news stories for them. So they completely ignore them. But the people that live in your neighborhood, the people that go to school with you, the people that go to work with you, most of those people don't have any power over what the media talks about. They're just hardworking people that are trying to live their lives. And so I'm hearing a lot of people say things like, the media is trying to divide us. The media is trying to divide us. Don't let the media divide us. And you know what? Some of that is true. Some of that is happening. But you wanna know one of the biggest ways we can be divided between ourselves? It's not just by listening to what the media says, but it's by not listening to what real individuals are saying who have nothing to do with the media stories at all. You know, I'll give you one quick example of this. You, uh, we, we just saw recently that there were a number of politicians who, um, who wore like African style garb. And I immediately saw people just kind of rushing into their usual left versus right rhetoric and being like, ah, see, look at the left trying to placate, look at the left with their phony way of doing things. And when you talk to real people on the ground, not, not, not to people that are running TV stations and newspapers, you saw black people on the left making fun of this. You saw white people on the left making fun of this. You saw people on both sides saying, man, I see right through this, this ain't real. And you saw people who were actually inspired by it, who felt like, hey, at least they're trying. But there's a lot of nuance in what people think on all sides of the, on all points on the political spectrum. But this is the kind of stuff that you don't find out unless you have meaningful conversation with real human individuals. So sometimes it's good to just turn off the TV, take a break from all the articles that are being shared, take a break from how the media is representing people and get out there and talk to real people. Because just because there are people with political and economic agendas who are pouring fuel on the fire, it doesn't mean that there aren't real human beings out there that are living in the midst of that fire, that are filling that fire. And you can learn a lot of things by talking to those people. It makes you a better person, makes other people better, a better, better people. And that's really how we put out the fire. That's really how we conquer the division, by grounding our pursuit of unity not in making, not in scoring points against one another on social media, but by actually engaging one another in the real world and not letting what we watch on the media be a substitute for real human interaction. Peace. I'm out.